Greek Myths by Deborah Locke. Stories of the Old. In ancient times, the people of Greece built huge temples where they worshiped their gods and goddesses. Where did the idea of these gods come from? Like all cultures, the Greeks wanted to understand the changing seasons, the weather, why good and bad things happened to them, and what happened when they died. Their answers lay in the belief that there were gods and goddesses who took an interest in people's everyday lives. They told stories about these immortals that we call myths. These included tales of heroes, monsters, and spirits. Family of Greek gods. Let's begin at the beginning with the god of the heavens, Uranus, and the earth's goddess, Gaia. Their children were the race of Titans, a group of powerful giants who roamed the heavens and earth. The youngest, Cronus, the god of time, took control when he killed his father. Aphrodite, the goddess of love, sprang from the sea as Uranus was cut into pieces. Cronus had three sons, Zeus, Sidon, and Hades. He also had three daughters, Hista, Demeter, and Hera. It was these immortals and their children who appeared in many of the Greek myths. The beautiful son of Aphrodite, Eros, was the god of love. In myths, he was known for shooting his arrow at people to make them fall in love. Zeus was waged a terrifying war against his father and some of the titans and defeated them. He then became the god of the heaven and earth and went on to father many gods, goddesses, and heroes. He lived with his wife, Hera, along with Demeter, Aphrodite, and his eight immortal children on the Mount Olympus, the highest mountain in Greece. Hista, the goddess of the home, gave up her seat on Olympus to look after the fire within the mountain. Poseidon, the god of the sea, lived in his golden underwater palace, stirring up storms and earthquakes if, as if he was angry. Hades was the dark god of the underworld, the place where people went when they died. Demeter, the goddess of crops, had a beautiful daughter named Persephone. Hades kidnapped Persephone and made her his wife in the underworld. As Demeter grieved, the earth became frozen and nothing grew. Zeus ordered Hades to free Persephone. When she saw her daughter again, Demeter's sadness melted. Winter faded and the plants grew. However, Persephone had, got, had eaten six pomegranate seeds during her time in the underworld. So each year she had to spend six months with Hades. For the other six months, she could be with her mother, and the seasons changed to spring and summer. Many of Zeus's immortal children had unusual birth stories. One day, Zeus had a bad headache. He asked his son, Havestus, to split open his head with an axe. Out sprang Athena, dressed for battle and shouting her war cry. Just like us, these Titanic Olympians had emotions such as love, jealousy, and anger. They were fascinated by people and meddled in their lives with both heroic and fateful consequences. Athena City. After the capital of Greece was named after Athena, she won a competition against Poseidon. Zeus and his eight children. Zeus, the god of thunder and lightning. Ares the god of war, Hebe, the goddess of youth, Dionysus, the god of wine and feasting, Artemis, the god of moon and wild animals, Apollo, the god of light, music, and healing, Hermione, the god of trade, protector of travelers, Athena, the goddess of wisdom and war, and her facetious Hephaestus, the god of blacksmith fire. Pandora's jar. According to legend, Zeus wanted to create a race of people. He ordered Prometheus, one of the titans, 
to mold men and women out of clay in the likeness of the gods. Zeus then breathed life into the people. Prometheus lived among the people and taught them how to build homes, grow plants, and hunt animals. He begged Zeus to give them fire so they could cook and make metal tools, but Zeus refused. It will make them as powerful as the gods, he said. However, Prometheus stole some fire from the rising sun. When Zeus saw the people using fire, he was very angry and severely punished Prometheus. Eternal Punishment For disobeying Zeus, Prometheus was chained to a high rock and had his liver torn out each day by an eagle. Since he was an immortal, his liver grew back each night. Zeus also wanted to punish the people, so he asked Hephaestus to make a woman in his blacksmith fire. The gods gave, his, gave her gifts such as beauty, love, curiosity, and desert. They named her Pandora, meaning all gifted. She was sent to Prometheus' brother, Epimetheus. She was also given a jar, which she was forbidden to open. Although his brother had warned him not to accept a gift from Zeus, Epimetheus was enchanted with Pandora and married her. Pandora could not forget about the jar. One day, she peeked inside, and all the evils flew out into the world. Sickness, sin, and death. As she closed the lid, hope was the only thing left in the jar. Labors of... Hercules. This is the tale of the greatest and strongest of our heroes. Hercules was the son of Zeus, but his extremely jealous was extremely jealous. He was the son of Zeus, but his mother was a mortal woman. Hera was extremely jealous of Hercules. He grew into a determined, wise young man with superhuman strength and skill. Zeus wanted his son to become a god when he died. Hera replied, I will only agree to this if Hercules can perform 12 labors to be sent forth by his cousin Eurysetheus, the king of Mycenae. Super strong. Hercules lay in his cot. Hera sent serpents to kill him. Even though he was only a baby, Hercules strangled them with his bare hands. Eurysetheus hated Hercules and hoped for his death. You fir your first task is to kill the lion, which is devouring the people of Nemea, he commanded. The Nemean lion had skin that could not be pierced by weapons, so Hercules followed the lion into its cave and wrestled with it. After strangling it to death, he returned to Eurythyces, wearing the lion's skin as armor. Hercules successfully completed the task after task. His eleventh task was to steal some golden apples that grew on a tree in a garden that was guarded by three maidens called Hesperides, along with a fire serpent. After seeking advice from the gods, Hercules went to, first went to the Her Hercipedes' father, Atlas. He was one of the titans defeated long ago by Zeus. Atlas's everlasting punishment was to hold up the heavens on his shoulders. If you ask your daughters for a couple of apples, he offered Hercules, I will hold up the heavens for a while. Atlas agreed, but asked Hercules to kill the serpent first. Hercules did this by shooting a single arrow over the garden wall. He then took up Atlas's burden. When Atlas returned with the apples, he did not want to take the heavens back. I'd be delighted to continue, Hercules said, but could you just take them for a moment so I can make a grassy cushion for my shoulder? When Atlas took the heavens back, Hercules picked up the apples and walked away and went on to complete his twelfth labor. Zeus was pleased. When Hercules died, he joined the gods on Mount Olympus. He became the guardian of the door to the heavens. The Zeus and Minotaur. Just off the coast of Greek is an island called Crete. It was here say the myths, that a most fearsome creature called the Minotaur lived during the reign of King Minos. The Minotaur was half man and half bull, and only ate human flesh. 
The beast was so terrible that the king commanded his greatest craftsman, Didalus, to build a labyrinth that no one else could escape from. The bulls of Gnosis. When the ancient palace of Gnosis in Crete was excavated, images of bulls were found. Some think this proves that the ancient Cretans were worshipped by bulls. At the center of the maze lived Minotaur. Every nine years, seven boys and seven girls were sent from Athens to be fed to the Minotaur. This was payment from the king of Athens, Agathus, for accidentally causing the death of Minos' son many years before. The third payment was now due. Okay, In Athens, the victims were being selected. A young prince named Theus was offered to go and kill the Minotaur. He was adopt the adopted son of Agnes and the son of sea god Poseidon. The ship that Zeus took to create had black sails, but this time the crew took white sails with them. If you succeed, raise the white sails on your return, said Agassiz to his son. When they arrived at Crete, the Athenians were met by King Minos and his daughter, Adrian. She fell in love with the Zeus and at first sight. I'll help you kill the Minotaur if you take me back to Athens and make me your wife, she said. He agreed. Tie one of the end of this magical ball thread to the, to the entrance of the labyrinth and follow it to the center, Adrian instructed. Go at night while the Minotaur sleeps. After killing it, roll the thread back up, and it will lead you to out. That night, the glimmering thread led the Zeus to Minotaur, which he wrestled and killed. When he arrived back at the entrance, Adrian and the Th Ath Athenians were waiting. They were bored. But they boarded their ship and set sail for Athens. On the way, the Zeus left Adrian asleep on the island of Naxos before he did not love her because he did not love her. He also forgot to change the sails from black to white. When King Aegeus saw the black sails, he thought his son was dead and threw himself into the sea. The Zeus's triumphant return was overshadowed by grief. The Fall of Incarus King Minos was furious that Zeus had succeeded in defeating the Minotaur. He put the inventor of the labyrinth, Didaeus, and his lazy son, Icarus, into prison. Didaeus started planning how to escape. He collected feathers from passing birds and made two pairs of wings by threading the fe feathers together and sealing them with wax from their candles. Finally, they were ready to escape. Put on these wings, Didaeus told Incris, and follow me and don't fly too low or too high. They both took flight over the sea. Incris was careful at first, but then soared upward, feeling free like a bird. The sun's heat melted his wings. He tumbled to his death. When Didaeus looked back for his son, he could only see feathers floating on the water. Adventures of Perseus. There was a young man named Perseus who lived with his beautiful mother, Danae, on the island of Sepharios. The king, Polydectes, wanted to marry Danae, but Perseus protected her. So Polydectes tricked Perseus into attempting an impossible task. Polydectes held a feast. Being poor, Perseus came with no gift, but he promised the king a present. Bring me the head of the Gorgon Medusa, challenged Polydectes. The Gorgons were the three fearsome, scaly monsters who had snakes for hair. Anyone who looked at Medusa's face turned to stone. Perseus's father was none other than Zeus from Olympus and was sent, sent Athena and Hermione to help his son. They gave him the shiniest shield and the sharpest sickle in the world. Following their advice, Perseus then visited the nymphs of the North Wind. These female spirits loaned him some winged sandals, a leather bag, and Hades' cap of invisibility. Wearing the sandals and cap, Perseus flew unseen to the far west where he found the tree Gorgons asleep. The three Gorgons asleep. 
Looking at only Medusa's reflection in the shield, he cut off her head with the sickle and put it into the bag. When Perseus killed Medusa, a winged horse Pegasus sprang from her body. Another myth tells how a body, a boy named Bellophon, tamed Pegasus using Athena's brittle. As Perseus flew home, he saw a beautiful princess, Andromeda, chained to a rock. Her parents had angered Poseidon and were sacrificing her to a sea monster to appease him. Story in the Stars. Several well-known star patterns have been named after characters in Perseus' story. They include Perseus, Andromeda, her parents, and the sea monster. As the monster rose from the waves, Perseus held up Medusa's head and turned the monster to stone. Perseus married Andromeda and took her back to Sephiroth. King Polydectes made Danae a slave and was surprised to see Perseus. Where's my gift? he asked. Without a word, Perseus held up the head of Medusa and the king turned to stone. The foolishness of Midas. Not all myths are about heroes. Some tell of very foolish mortals who used misused gifts from gods. One such person was King Midas. One day, Midas found an old satire named Salinas in his garden. Salinas was drunk after feasting with the god Dionysus. King Midas looked after Salinas very well and then returned him to Dionysus, who lived by the banks of the river Petculus. At thanks, Dionysus pr promised Midas any gift he wanted. Let everything I touch turn to gold, replied Midas greedily. His wish was granted. Mischievous satires. Satires were roguish male spirits of nature who roamed the woods and mountains. They were half man and half goat and had horns and hooves and tails. With delight, Midas turned his palace and all the trees and flowers into gold. However, his pleasure was short-lived. As he picked up food and drank his wine, he also turned to gold. Then he hugged his daughter. To his horror, she turned to gold too. Midas returned from Dionysus and begged to be freed from his gift. Wash away your greed in the spring of the river Patactylus, Dionysus told him. As Midas bathed in the river, the water turned to gold. However, Midas had not learned from his foolishness. Midas was a worshiper of Pan, the mischievous goat-like god of wild places. He enjoyed listening to Pan play country tunes on his reed pipes. One day, Pan boasted that he was a better musician than Apollo, the god of music, and challenged him to a contest. The contest was to be judged by the river god, Molus. Midas came along to listen and judge for himself. Pan's merry tunes were no match for Apollo's litting lyre music, and Tom Molus awarded the prize to Apollo. However, Midas said he preferred Pan's playing. In anger, Apollo gave Midas a pair of long, hairy donkey ears. Midas covered his ears in a turban, but people found out about them, and he died of shame. Orpheus and Eurydice. Miss claimed that the most gifted musician who ever lived was Orpheus. Orpheus was married to the beautiful Eurydice, but their happiness was cut short when she was bitten by a serpent and died. Filling, filled with aching sorrow, Orpheus took his lute and traveled to the underworld to try and get her back. On the shore of the river Styx, he met the ferryman who rode dead souls to the gates of Hades' kingdom. Orpheus played a sad song that charmed the ferryman into taking him across the river. At the gates, the watchdog, Serbius, stood guard. Orpheus lured the creature to sleep with a lullaby. Music in his blood. Orpheus was the son of Apollo and the muse of Calopia. There were nine muses or goddesses of art who were said to inspire poets, musicians, artists, and writers. As Orpheus made his way in the dark, kingdom to see Hades. The sweet music he played soothed the screaming pain of tormented souls. 
Hades was angry that a living person had entered his realm. But when Orpheus played his music, Hades wept iron tears. Eurydice may follow you to the upper world, Hades said, on the condition that you don't look at her until she has reached the sunlight. Orpheus made this his way to the surface, playing joyful tunes. But as he reached the sunlight, he looked back. For a moment, he saw Eurydice nearly alive again, just inside the entrance to the underworld. Then she faded once more into a pale ghost and disappeared. He had lost her forever. <laughs> the end. <laughs>